Good morning. How's it going? All right. I like this interaction here. So if you are, uh, if you're new, if you're, you're just joining us, we are, uh, as Bailey said, in the last uh, week of our BLESS series. Uh, and, and this has been a series, this has been a discussion about how we can actually uh, bless the people around us, how we can be a, a light in the darkness, uh, we, can, we can encourage, we can provide, we can serve. Uh, and so it's based off an acronym, uh, and it starts with B, obviously, um, before anything else, pray. Uh, we're going to pray before anything else we do, and that's so critical. It's a, it's a, it should be a key piece of your life as a follower of Jesus. L is, uh, bless is listen. Yes, so listen. <laughs> I apparently wasn't listening that week. I forgot that one. Listen, and, and listening is, is something that I think uh, a lot of us uh, fail to do uh, because it gives us control over a, of a conversation if we talk, if we can keep going. Uh, if we're listening, it seems more passive, but it's really key to showing people how much you love them. E is eat, which, as I've said many times, was my favorite one, and it just continues to be my favorite thing ever. Uh, S is serve, serving other people. And then uh, last week we talked about sharing uh, your story, sharing your story about what God has done in your life. Uh, and Jeff talked about last week how that's, that's really important. It's, it's a beautiful piece of, of following Jesus is actually having not just his story, but your story alongside of his as well. And this week, uh, we're wrapping up by talking about sharing the story of Jesus. Now, in my life, uh, I grew up in an evangelical Christian household, grew up Baptist, and so sharing your faith, sharing your story, uh, sharing the story of Jesus was always something that was, that was hammered into me. And I think when I heard share your story, what I really heard was sell your story. And sell the story of Jesus Christ. And I'm not very comfortable selling things. I'm not a salesman. That's not, not how I function as a person. Uh, when I was younger, in middle school, uh, I had a, a, a business. Yes, I was a small uh, business entrepreneur, uh, so I can talk to you about all your business needs. Uh, I had a vegetable selling business. Uh, I would load up a, a duffel bag, a Coca-Cola duffel bag, and I would carry it around my neighborhood with individually wrapped bags of different vegetables from my family's garden. Uh, my dad picked all the vegetables. I had zero overhead. It was great. And I would just walk from door to door, this pudgy little middle schooler, and I'd knock on the door and be like, hey, do you want to buy vegetables? I've got like four cucumbers for a dollar, which is 97. That was great. A great deal even then. Uh, four tomatoes for a dollar, 10 squash for a dollar. It was a great deal. I was cutting Kroger's legs right out from under him uh, with my small empire. And I should have had him buy me out now that I think about it. Anyway, marketing I got. Cute little middle schooler with a big old oversized duffel bag of vegetables, like with cheap groceries. Like it sold itself. But if somebody said no, like, nah, I'm not interested. I had no way to sell to them. Because I didn't really understand all the things you could do with vegetables. I was a kid. I didn't know. I'd be like, hey, do you know what you can do with this cucumber? You can chop it up and put it in a salad. You can... I still don't know a lot about cucumbers, apparently. <laughs> I'm not very uh, uh, passionate about vegetables. I didn't like them at the time. I, I, was, I was a kid, right? So pizza, you know, chocolate, the stuff with cookies, like that was my, my jam. So I wasn't going to be like, hey, this is really good. You should, you should like this tomato. Oh, look. And I wasn't passionate about vegetables, like my dad would bring home this bucket full of vegetables and I'd be in my bedroom playing video games or whatever it was I was doing that day and I would look and I'd see him coming in from the garden and be like, oh man, I'm gonna have a very sweat, sweaty and hot evening walking around the Georgia heat with this big old duffel bag. I wasn't passionate about it. And I think when we think about sharing the gospel, those kinds of things influence how we talk about sharing the story of Jesus in that we feel like we have to sell it. And if you're selling a product that you're, you're not really certain about, you're not confident in, you're not using yourself, it can feel awkward. So what I want us to do today is rather than thinking about selling the story of Jesus, I want us to talk about how we can share it and do it in an authentic, genuine way where it comes from our heart. Okay? So we're going to be in John chapter 3, probably the most famous passage in all of scripture, John 3, 1 to 16. And we're going to have to think about some things to change the, our approach to sharing Jesus. And the first is that the story that we're telling can be bewildering. It can be confusing. Look at verse one. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And this man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Now, we're very familiar with this story. If you grew up in church, if you've seen a football game, you've seen John 3.16 sticking up somewhere, we know the story a bit of Nicodemus. But our familiarity with it uh, creates a barrier to us really understanding what's going on. There's a lot of unanswered questions in this story. Why is Nicodemus there? Why did he go and see Jesus? It might be that he's from the Pharisees, right? And they're kind of Jesus's antagonist throughout his ministry. So maybe he's there to, to really trap Jesus. I don't get that vibe from him, but maybe. Maybe he was sent by the Pharisees to kind of feel Jesus out. Where are you at, man? You land on our side or somebody else's. Maybe Nicodemus is genuinely interested. He's like, I have seen you do things that nobody else can do, and I gotta know more. We don't know why he does that. We don't know why he says we. We know that you're from, uh, you're from God. We don't know why he says we. Is he talking about the Pharisees? Is he talking about him and another group? Is he talking about like himself and the, like, the first person plural, and that's just how Nicodemus talks? It's probably not likely. We don't know why he comes at night. Why does he show up in the dark? Is it because he's embarrassed and ashamed and he wants to keep his, his thoughts about Jesus on the DL? Maybe. It might be that just that's when he could schedule a meeting with Jesus. Who knows? And what we don't realize too, and if I can say this, I know this is like people's favorite passage of scripture, so please don't be offended when I say this. This conversation is straight up weird. It's an awkward conversation. Nicodemus says, we know that you've come from God because nobody could do the things that you do, period. It's not a question. And then what does Jesus say? It says, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say nobody can see the kingdom unless they're born again or born from above. The idea of being transformed. Nicodemus didn't ask a question, man. He wasn't even talking about the kingdom. It's a random response from Jesus, if I can say that. Now, probably what's going on is Nicodemus has an implied question underneath what he's saying. He says, I can see that you've come from God. Clearly, you're important. How important are you? Are you the Messiah? Are you the guy that we're expecting? Are you gonna bring in the kingdom? And Jesus' response then makes sense, and it reads almost as if he's saying, look, dude, it doesn't matter if I bring in the kingdom or not. Unless you're born again, you're not gonna see it, so it doesn't matter for you. You gotta be born again. And so Nicodemus, rightly, probably being an older man, says, well, how can I, I can't be born again. I can't go back and reenter my mother's womb. That doesn't make any sense. And plus, at this point, his mother's probably dead. So he's got some major complications here. And so Jesus clarifies. He clarifies by saying, you need to be born of the spirit and of water. People, I just, just give you a heads up. We still don't know what that means. Like, I don't mean like we don't have any idea. We have some ideas, but there's not a lot of agreement on what it means. Some people think it means baptism, water, and spirit being transformed inside. Some people think it means a natural birth, like think when a woman's water breaks, so that would be born of water, and then of spirit, God doing something in your heart. And then some people think it's just the same thing. Water and spirit are both uh, ideas for cleansing. You have to be transformed, you have to be changed before you can ever see the kingdom of God. That's probably where I land. You gotta be cleansed, you gotta be changed. And then Jesus continues to clarify by saying, oh, and by the way, the spirit of God moves and works and you just can't really control him. It's confusing, it's bewildering. I say all of this to show you how confusing the gospel can be for people. For many of us, those of us that grew up in church or that have a more philosophical mind, we get the components of it. It makes sense to us. In the same way for some of us, that like a heart transplant makes sense. Like I get the components of a heart transplant, okay? Old heart bad, old heart come out. New heart good, new heart go in. Person live. That's a heart transplant. I just explained it to you. <laughs> now what I can't do is I can't disconnect old heart without killing somebody. I can't put a new heart in also without killing someone. I can't even tell you when you need the new heart. You could be having a panic attack and I'd be like, ah, uh, heart transplant, I don't know. And for some people, when it comes to the gospel, that's what they don't understand. They don't understand why this guy who died 2,000 years ago and supposedly rose again from the dead has any bearing on their life today. They don't understand why they need to believe in him. They don't understand how to believe in him versus themselves. They don't get it. It's confusing. It's bewildering. It doesn't make sense. And I want to be clear about something. 
It's not because people that aren't Christians are cognitively behind us that are Christians. That's not what's happening. They're spiritually dead. They're spiritually dead. They, they, they can't uh, understand in their heart. They can't believe without the spirit of God working. It's why before anything else, we pray. Because the spirit of God has to do something. If you don't have that component in blessing other people, guess what bless then spells? Less. And you're doing less for your neighbors if you're not praying for them. The B is critical. Go out and explain calculus or your job to a dead body. See how they handle that. They're not gonna respond. They can't respond. And that's what's happening. Until the spirit of God works in our hearts and transforms us, we can't really grasp the gospel. And this should help us in being authentic as we share our faith. Because one, we can be empathetic. There was a time in your life when you did not understand the gospel. You may have been very little, but there was a time in your life where you didn't get it either. And you're able to say, hey, I, don't, I know you don't understand. Or you can sympathize. You can empathize with how somebody's processing it. If somebody's walking in darkness, and what that means is their eyes haven't been opened to what God is doing in their life, they may grasp for, for something else. They may grasp for another faith, another religion. How many of you ever been in a, in a dark room that you're not familiar with? and you like knock stuff over and you're fumbling around trying to find the light. That's what it's like for people that don't know Christ. They're trying to find the light. They're trying to find something that works. How many of you just want something that works? I know I do. When I buy a product, I just want something that works. I don't care how it looks. That's probably why I eat McDonald's all the time. I don't care how you look. It tastes good. We need to sympathize with the fact that people uh, that we share the story of God with. That they need time. They need patience. They need empathy. We need to, to, to love them through that. And people also need you to explain it to them. Okay? That's the other thing we learn from this. People aren't just going to look at your life and be like, oh yeah, totally need Jesus. We have to open our mouths. We have to explain it. And you don't have to defend creation or defend the Trinity. Don't worry about that so much. If you want to, go for it. But you don't have to worry about that. Given the basics, Jesus crucified, buried, resurrected, and you need him. And here's why I know that. Because there's hurt, there's pain in your life, and you need to rescue you from it. We need to share with people. Because short of a miracle, which I think does happen, God has chosen that the primary way in which people come to know him is through other people telling him, telling them about him. And when you do this, you're authentic, you're real, you're compassionate. You know who your favorite teachers were? the ones that were patient with you. The ones that were hard or didn't explain things well, those are the ones I couldn't stand. But the ones that took their time with you, those are the ones you really appreciated, right? Be that kind of a teacher. So the Bible, the, the, the story of the gospel is bewildering. But the other cool thing about it is it's believable. It's actually a believable story. Look at verse nine. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? And I would love to exasperatingly say that even better. Like I think Nicodemus is just blown away. Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we've seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you of earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Nicodemus says, how can this be? How does this even make sense? And Jesus says in response, like, dude, you're supposed to be teaching people about this. You're supposed to have the right understanding of the Bible. You're supposed to be able to instruct people and walk people through this. How am I supposed to explain this to you if you're not getting it? Now, one of the things that I don't think we think about a lot when we read Jesus' interactions with the Pharisees, we don't think a lot about the fact that in Jesus' day and age, Nicodemus was the more authoritative person. Jesus was the minority position. He was the upstart. He was the conspiracy theory. He was the guy that you kind of, he was the blog writer, and like Nicodemus is the guy with like three PhDs, right? Like that was the difference between the two of them. Nowadays, we think like Jesus, the authority, and we, rightly we should. But in Nicodemus' day, eh, Nicodemus knows what he's talking about. And so what Jesus does here to convince Nicodemus and say, look, here's why you should believe me and let go of everything you've ever learned in your life is based on experience. 
Because Jesus says, nobody has ascended into heaven except for the one who's descended from heaven, which is kind of a weird statement, but then you think about who Jesus is, and it's not that weird. Jesus is the one who was in heaven, and now he's on earth, living and talking with Nicodemus, which means Jesus is basically saying, look, dude, I know my interpretation of scripture is right because I was there. I was there when it happened. In fact, just heads up, I wrote it. I know what I'm talking about, the author's intent. I'm the one that intended this. So I can tell you that you're wrong about the way you're reading scripture because it's not the way that I should read scripture as Jesus. It's not the right way because it doesn't point to me. And this tells us exactly how we can tell people and share the story of the gospel. Because it's not just facts and information. We have to talk about what we've seen and what we've heard. Now, I know that we have not lived in biblical times. You've not been to heaven before. If you have, I'm sure there's a publisher that would love to make some money. You could write a book, go for it. But I am sure that God has done things in your life. And when we come and talk to people about the story of Jesus, it is so critical that we talk about what God is doing in our life even now. Even now, we've talked about the experience that we have with him. Do you believe that God wants to transform you? Do you believe that? And do you believe that God wants to transform other people and that they need transformation? I do. It's not because people are terrible. It's because we're all sinners and broken and we need transformation. We need transformation and and, and believing that transformation is gonna deliver them not just from sin, but from, from loneliness and pain and abuse and suffering. That's what the story of the gospel is. It's this life changing transformational thing. And you can only talk about what you've seen and what you've heard. And if the gospel hasn't transformed you, if it's not transforming you even today, there's no wonder it's a hard, you feel like you're selling something rather than sharing something. I was looking up this week when I was thinking about like peddling and selling stuff, and I was thinking about celebrity endorsements. And there's some pretty awful celebrity endorsements out there uh, of people that don't use the product. You're just like very clearly you don't use it. There were some that were very offensive. I couldn't use them. But I found one uh, that was not offensive. Uh, it was Paris Hilton for Carl's Jr. <laughs> so next time you head on down to the Carl's Jr., just know... Paris might be there, hanging out, <laughs> gorging herself on a $1,500 ham- or 1500, 1500 calorie hamburger, not a $1,500 hamburger. <laughs> but some of us, when we talk about the gospel, we're like Paris at Carl's Jr. Be like, yeah, I think this is a really great product. I don't use it myself. I don't let it change my life, but I think it should change yours. Some of us, the last time we had anything to do with God, it was when we were little. We walked an aisle or we got baptized. Tell you what, I want you to think about the best story you've ever had from your childhood. Think about your best story from childhood. Skinned knee or or great time with a friend. How often do you tell that story? Maybe once a year in a new group of people, maybe at the company Christmas party and everybody's like, oh, here's that story again. We don't tell it that often. Why? Because we don't often talk about the things that happened to us 20, 30, 40 years ago. We need certain context. But you know what I talk about a lot? You know what I won't be quiet about? The things that happened to me last week. The things that happened to me today. Things that are gonna happen to me next week. We talk about current events. And if God is not doing something currently in your life, there's a reason why your story's not believable. Is God changing your life today? Is he transforming you today? So what does this look like? Well, our life should be witness, our whole life. So everything we do should be talking about the story of God. Now, this is sort of the lifestyle evangelism idea that you've probably heard of before, and it's a key piece. Very often as Christians, we tend to think of ourselves as, I'm gonna show that I'm a follower of Jesus by what I'm against. So I'm not gonna smoke, I'm not gonna drink, I'm not gonna have sex, I'm not gonna play rock and roll music too loudly. I'm against those things, right? Right? But what is your faith gonna actually lead you to do? Are you gonna give? Are you gonna be generous? Because you look at what God has given to you and what God has done for you and think, well, God is clearly a generous God. If I'm being transformed to be more like him, I too should be generous. Are you gonna be forgiving? I've messed up, God has forgiven me. Therefore, when people mess up in my life, I'm going to be forgiving of them. Are you gonna serve? 
Jesus came to earth to serve others. I believe in him, I follow him, therefore I will serve. Too often as Christians, what we do is we define who we are by what we're against. We're against abortion, we're against homosexuality, we're against, we're against, we're against. And it just makes us sound like we're a bunch of no people all the time. You know, there's a passage in scripture, uh, 2 Corinthians 2.10, and it says, all of the promises of God are yes in Christ Jesus. You know what that tells me? God likes to say yes. God likes to say yes. Now, obviously, there are things that we should stand against and we should have stances against things. Absolutely. There's a, that's a, there's a place for that in our faith. But too often, we let our faith be defined by what we're against and we let everybody else drive the narrative. We let everybody else drive what's going on and then we chime in when we're like against something. If the gospel is the most powerful, life-changing, amazing, transformational story in history, it should absolutely set a course for where we're going to go and what we're going to do with our life. It should not be about what we're against. It should be about what we're for. And it's, I don't care who does this or who does that. I'm going this way. I have a quote on my wall in my office. And it's a Jonathan Edwards quote. It says, resolved, I will live for God. And if nobody else does, I will still live for God. What are you living for? And then what are you gonna open your mouth about? Because it's not just enough to live a certain way. You've gotta talk about it. You've gotta provide a commentary about what's going on. You've gotta tell people, this is why I do what I do. And you know what? I'm gonna be honest with you. Sometimes that's not even enough. Because again, remember, people are spiritually dead. If the spirit of God does not move and does not work in the lives of people, it doesn't matter how much we open our mouths, it doesn't matter how much we follow Christ with our lives, they're not gonna change. And if you want to bless people around you, as I've said before, and as I will continue to say, pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. Pray for them. And pray for yourself. So we've talked about the story of God being uh, this beautiful, or, or sorry, this, this thing that can be bewildering. We've also talked about how it should be believable in our lives. It shouldn't be a product that I sell that I don't use, but something that I buy wholesale. But we also need to talk about it being beautiful. If something is beautiful, if I think it's beautiful, then man, I'm passionate about it. I'm excited about it. I want people to know more about it, right? So depending on where you land in what you think about John 3.16, which we're about to read, John 3.16, uh, how many of you have a Bible right now uh, that has red letters when Jesus is speaking? How many of you got the red letter Bible? Good for you. Good for you. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> The red letter Bible is helpful, but for some of you in some translations, the red letter Bible stops at verse 15, and then it's back to the boring old dark print that's not as special. And then others of you have the red letters that just keep going all the way through John, I think, 321. Now, what's happening here is an interpretive decision because John doesn't change his voice in his writing when Jesus stops talking. So we don't know, is Jesus continuing to say, is he the one that says John 3.16 or is John providing his commentary on something that seems like a really confusing discussion? I tend to think that John is the one talking at John 3.16. He stopped the story for a little bit and he's like, let me tell you what's going on. It's a good author does that. It doesn't mean it's any less special, okay? I know some people are like, oh, but the words of Jesus said this himself. Guess what? Again, he's the word of God. John tells us this in John chapter one. He wrote it all. Everything's in red, okay? If that helps you, I, if I could, I'd make you a red letter Bible. It's just everything's in red because Jesus says it all, okay? He's the one that wrote it. Don't let, that, don't let that hang you up, okay? But I like the idea that John, this guy that has spent three years following behind Jesus, learning from him, and then it changes his life. He goes on to follow Jesus until his dying day. And John lives a long time after Jesus dies and is resurrected. And I like to think that John has spent all this time and out of his pen and out of his mind, through the inspiration of the Spirit, comes this verse. And he's thinking back on the man who changed his life, but also the man who cost him so much. You know what J Jesus cost John? You want to think about this for a minute? Jesus cost John a career in his father's business. John and James, his brother, were set up to inherit the family business of fishermen. He had a fishing, like, small business. I had vegetables. John had fishing. He was going to be much more successful. And he left it all behind to follow Jesus. Jesus cost John a safe and secure, respected place in the Jewish community. Imagine all the organizations that you're a part of, the things that people think well of you in. To follow Jesus, what if you had to give all those up to follow him? It'd be hard. 
He costs John security, comfort, because John is ridiculed, he's beaten, he's threatened, he's mocked. Jesus costs John his own brother. When you read the Gospels, it's James and John, James and John, James and John, until a few chapters in the book of Acts, and James is executed. James is the first of the apostles to be executed. John loses his brother for decades. Jesus also costs John his retirement years. Because while the rest of us might, you know, think about our 401k and, and, and sit up nice somewhere, John uh, got an island. He got an entire island to himself. It's called the island of Patmos. And he wasted his final days there, wasted them, all by himself, alone. All of his friends dead. And you know what John writes in his gospel? You know what John, all throughout his letters, his gospel, you know what he writes in the book of Revelation? You know what he won't stop talking about over and over and over and over and over again? You know what he'll stop talking about? The love of God. The love of God. He keeps talking about it. This this guy, this, this Messiah cost him so much. John's response is basically, it's worth it. It's worth it. The first words in the most famous verse in scripture is for God so loved. Jesus' story, John found it so beautiful, so engaging, so amazing that after 60 years going through all this pain and suffering, he still can't stop saying for God so loved, for God so loved, for God so loved. He calls himself the disciple that Jesus loved. He says we love because God loved us. John is consumed with it. And the the verse goes like this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. We've heard it so many times, it's almost trite. But what I wanna do is I I wanna walk you through John 3.16 and I wanna help you be able to share the story, Jesus' story, through John 3.16. Kind of a one verse evangelism type idea. Uh, Jeff, this week, Uh, online. Uh, You can watch a video of him walking you through, I think it's uh, Romans 6.23, another opportunity for one verse evangelism. So a couple different ways to do it. But let's start with, for God so loved the world. So our story is going to start with God. It's just God, Father, Son, Spirit, together. And because God is love, he decides to create. And he makes this place called the world, the universe. And he puts stars, and he puts comets, and he puts... uh, Chow chow puppies and all these things in this place. And to rule over this place, he creates a man and a woman, humanity. And he makes them special. He makes them in his image, the image of God. And that that means that they're supposed to rule and reign, to have authority over this place, but they're also supposed to represent him. Meaning they're supposed to have to show the rest of the world what is this God who made them like. And all they have to do is love him and trust him. And he's going to love them and give them responsibility. And it's going to be this beautiful relationship. But over the course of this relationship, mankind realizes that, you know what? Maybe we could do this without him. And in the middle of the place where they were at, there was a tree that they were told not to eat from. But they saw that it could give them knowledge. It could finally give them the ability to throw off the chains of God's love and do what they want to do. And they ate it. And everything breaks, everything fractures. Man's relationship, humanity's relationship with God fractures. No longer do they trust him. They don't think he's got good things for them anymore. They're filled with doubt and fear. And the fractured relationship goes into human to human relationships. There's violence, there's anger. There's distrust, there's abuse. Even man's relationship, humanity's relationship with creation breaks. Because no longer are we shepherding the creation that we've been given. We strip it to feed our comforts, to feed our needs. But God so loved the world that he gave. And God rescues. And he he decides, I'm not going to let this go to destruction. I'm going to step in and I'm going to rescue it. So he gives uh, gives promises. He gives promises to all sorts of people about how he's going to deliver them. And he gives them freedom from bondage. And he gives them guidelines, rules. Say, hey, we can have a good relationship. Let's, Let's follow these rules together. And then he gives them kings to show them how to do it. And he gives them prophets to show them how to come back to him. And it doesn't work. People can't keep up. And at the end of the Old Testament, they're just kind of looking at each other like, where did it go wrong? And you think it's over. But God so loved the world that he gave his son. He gave his son, the son of God, 
Jesus Christ, puts on flesh, dwells amongst men, and he does everything that a human being was ever supposed to do. He trusts his father. He does what his father says. He submits to him, even to the point of dying on the cross and paying the penalty for all the screwed up things humanity's ever done. Does it all. And because he was unjustly punished, he is raised from the dead on the third day. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whosoever believes in him. So now humanity has another opportunity. I don't gotta follow a bunch of rules. We have to believe that what Jesus did counts for us and it counts for you. All you have to do is put your faith in that, which means I think this counts for me and not anything else I do. That's not gonna get me credit with God. Jesus is the only way for me. And whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. That doesn't mean like you just get to get on a harp on a cloud and just kind of cruise through eternity. That's not what it means. It means new heaven, new earth, the Father dwelling on earth with his people, Jesus Christ returning, human beings in resurrected bodies, free of all the things that that impair us, disabilities, sin, brokenness, death, gone. And that's the story of the gospel, and that is beautiful. It's beautiful. And it can be your story today if it's not already. You can believe and you can say, that's my story now. My story with Jesus' story together. Now you might say, if I wanna share that with somebody, Travis, that was pretty long. Fair enough. It's the whole Bible. So here's how you break it down. It's four components. Creation. There was God and he made a world. Fall. He made people. They messed up. Redemption. He did some things. He sent his son to die on the cross to pay for the penalties of their sin and to bring them into a relationship with him to free them from everything that ever happened. Restoration. And Jesus is coming back one day to set everything right. And he wants you to come to the party. Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. That's the story of the gospel. And the reason why it doesn't sound authentic is because what we usually do is we start with fall. Everybody's screwed up. Don't start there. The world was made good. It was made beautiful. And God wants to make it beautiful again. And he wants you to be there and he wants you to do it with him. Will you come with him? Today's Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday in 1991 was the day that I believed the beautiful story. 30 years ago on Palm Sunday. Will this be your Palm Sunday? Will you let Jesus, instead of processing into Jerusalem, will you let him process into your heart that you might live eternity with him? I think today's a great day to do just that. You can come join us in the Next Steps room. You can fill out something online. If you're watching us online, type it into the chat however you want to. But I would love for this story to be yours. Let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, It's a beautiful story. And I can tell it again and again and again and again and again. But Lord, you have to move. Your spirit has to work in the lives of people, those who are far away and those who are near. And so God, I pray that right now they would, that they would feel the work of your spirit in their lives and they would be moved to act. I pray that they would join the procession, join the party and that we would go and share the good news, that we would make invitations to other people to come and join the celebration as well of our risen Lord and Savior. It's in his great name we pray.